Is this on? All right. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, and it's an honor to be here with all of you today. This is very outside of my field, epidemiology, but it's been really heartening to see uh, a, a field where the impact of your work is just so concrete in the real world that like you just see the impact of it uh, uh, very, very readily, whereas in my field, we're a, little, we're a little kind of elongated from practical relevance sometimes. Um, so it's, it's great to be in, uh, in Sweden again. Like I like was said, I, I did my master's degree in Uppsala. Um, today is Thanksgiving, so for all you Americans in the audience, happy Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> a few turkeys uh, will be spared today because of us being here. Um, so I, I started my lab about a year and a half ago in Seattle at the Institute for Systems Biology. Uh, we're a pretty small lab, two postdocs and a grad student with a couple of interns. And uh, like was said, I, I am interested in the ecology and evolution of microbial communities. I started off in environmental microbiology and I've slowly moved into poop. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting that medicine now, you know, e ecology is sort of becoming a, a new branch of medicine. It's sort of changing the way we think about the human body and we think about disease rather than one pathogen, one disease. You can have more complex disease etiologies where you're in fact missing commensal microbes that actually provide beneficial support to your body uh, rather than having just a, a pathogen invade. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of introduction to the human microbiome for those who, who may not be as familiar. Uh, and then I'll, I'll delve into uh, work out of my own lab and I have one one project uh, in my lab that's that's sort of relevant to epidemiology, so you're gonna you're gonna get that in, in, in the case of Clostridium difficile infection. Okay, this works. So I love this cartoon from the New Yorker. Uh, you have this little baby getting uh, approached by this uh, very menacing-looking cloud of microorganisms. Uh, we know now, uh, this, it, it was a bit of a controversy for a while, whether there's a placental microbiome or not, I'm, I'm sort of in the camp that uh, there is not. Uh, so uh, in the womb, we are essentially uh, sterile. <laughs> I think most of the evidence says that for the, for the most part, we're, we're essentially sterile in the womb. Uh, but as soon as we're born, we're inundated with trillions and trillions of microorganisms, uh, mostly from mom at first. Our mom is kind of like our, our sourdough starter culture uh, when we come out. Uh, but we also uh, acquire strains from the environment over the course of our lives. Um, so like I said, trillions of, of microorganisms. This is a bit of an outdated uh, graphic from the American Museum of Natural History. We used to think there's about uh, one human cell to every 10 microbial cells in our bodies. That's, that's been updated with more accurate estimates. In reality, we're about on par. There's about 40 trillion bacterial cells in our bodies and about 30 trillion human cells. And depending on when your last bowel movement was, um, you might be more human than microbe, uh, but eventually they, they'll overtake us. So they, they outnumber us by a little bit, by the numbers. But microbial cells are, are teeny. They're a couple orders of magnitude smaller than a, than a human cell. So mass-wise, uh, that's only about a half a pound to a pound of material. I'm not sure what that is in metric. As far as genetics go, though, the human microbiome is a, is a huge component of, of our bodies, genetically speaking. About 23,000 genes in the human genome uh, but about uh, two to, I think, up to four million genes estimated in the microbiome. And many of these genes are incredibly important for the functionality of our bodies. Right? Our microbes allow us to digest plant polysaccharides that we otherwise could not absorb through our, th through our diet. So we get calories from fiber and, and polyphenols and things that we can't digest ourselves. Uh, in addition to that, they do important functions like training our immune system, especially in early life. Um, and importantly for this conference, they, they, they perform a function in uh, preventing infectious disease. They're actually a, a, a barrier to infectious disease and are a, kind of a wing of our immune system in a sense. So the, the human body is, well, topologically speaking, you can think of the human body as a torus. Uh, those, of you, those of you who aren't topologists, that's a donut. Uh, so our body is one continuous surface. Our, the interior of our gut and the outside of our skin is exposed to the outside world, right? And across that barrier is, it, is our interior, our bloodstream, our organs, and so on. Uh, so everywhere that is exposed to the outside world, including our gastrointestinal tract, is covered in bacteria. Th that hopefully that doesn't gross you out. I th the, that, that's actually a good thing. You want that. Um, the environments of your body are incredibly diverse and distinct. Uh, you can think about your skin. It's, it's sort of like the Sahara, right? It's a little drier. It's exposed to, to UV radiation. Um, very particular organisms living on the skin. And the gut you might think of as like a tropical rainforest. It's very moist and, and warm, uh, anaerobic, lack of oxygen. And about 99% of all the biomass in the human body, microbial biomass, is pent up in the large intestine. So most of the actual mass of the microbiome is in the, in the colon. So we know that um, 
we have organismal filters on our, on our development and environmental input over the course of our lives. Our genome essentially can define uh, whether we go down a, a disease or, or health trajectory based on certain exposures. But more and more, we're learning that the microbiome is another one of these organismal filters. Uh, and a nice thing about the microbiome is it's a heck of a lot more plastic than the genome. You can actually change the structure of the microbiome and the composition of the microbiome. You can do that with the genome too, people working on CRISPR uh, therapies for certain genetic disorders, but it's a lot easier to change the microbiome than it is to change the human genome. And there's a lot of smoke in the microbiome field. If you look across any given disease condition, you find that there are statistical, statistically significant differences between healthy and diseased people in the composition of the microbiota. But so what, right? Does that actually affect the health of, of the host? So that's, that's what my lab does, is trying to, to connect the dots between ecological variation in the microbiome, uh, some of it might, might not be neither here nor there when it comes to the health of the host, and the host, the host component. And, and a lot of that involves taking dense phenotypic measures on the host, like whole genome sequencing or blood metabolomics and so on. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Before, before we go too deep, I want to sort of talk about what we think of as, as healthy in the context of the microbiome, uh, and, and essentially, so this is a, this is a data set we, we just recently published. This is one of the last papers I worked on in my postdoc out of the Alm lab, where uh, you know Eric Alm has this company called Open Biome. It's a nonprofit, and they make uh, donor material for fecal transplants. They recruit really really healthy people and screen them, and they collect their poop, and they put it in the freezer. And so for about 90 people, we had a, a freezer backlog of all these samples that we could pull out. Uh, and one thing that's really missing in our field are time series, having really good, dense, long time series. So we pulled out 10 people where we had three to five samplings per week over the course of a year to two years. And what you see is what we kind of knew already. Uh, we are self-similar over time. Everyone is their own unique microbiome snowflake, and you look more similar to yourself than to others. Um, there are many ways, it seems, to have a healthy microbiome. These are all very healthy people. Another interesting observation from time series analysis is that if two people share a microbe, so here the dots are all individual species from the microbiome, and this is person one and person two, and we're plotting as the log median abundance of that organism in that person's system. So if a bacterium, if a species that's shared between these two people is abundant in one, it's, it's abundant in the other, generally speaking. So it, it seems that the sort of ecological niche, the metabolic niche of that species is fairly well conserved across the human population. Well, if that's the case, then why are there so many differences from person to person? Well, generally speaking, these differences can be explained by presence absence. So any, any given pair of people, they maybe share about 30% of the species in their microbiomes. Uh, and then if you do you know, the Venn diagram of three people, that drops precipitously. It gets down to the single digits and eventually very, very low. There's very few species that are shared across the whole population. Maybe certain bacteroides and like Fecalibacterium presnitzii, but, but not that many. So our differences are defined by absences, share, uh, ha not having shared taxa. So the overall conclusion there is there's a universe of microbial diversity out there and each one of us is selecting a subset of that diversity to colonize our guts, and that builds a sort of metabolically healthy gut microbiome. So there are many ways to build one of these healthy microbiomes. What about when the microbiome breaks? How do we define a sick microbiome? What is dysbiosis, this very vague term? Uh, so this is work, uh, again, in the OM lab, I, I worked with Claire Duvalet, a, a really excellent graduate student, on a meta-analysis of case control studies uh, for different diseases. And the ones that you see here are diseases where we had at least, I think, three or four independent studies that we could look across. And this is essentially a fingerprint for, for those different diseases. So the top row are organisms that are enriched in either healthy or sick people. Enriched in sick is red, enriched in healthy is blue. Uh, but these are all organisms that uh, are non-specifically enriched across many diseases. They essentially show up in many diseases. They're not specific to a single disease. If we look at uh, diseases like colorectal cancer, we see that a, a sparse smattering of things are enriched, but you, don't, you only see enrichment for bad stuff, right, the bad guys. So in CRC, the bad guys are enriched, and uh, the opposite effect is seen in diseases like IBD inflammatory bowel disease, where you see a consistent depletion in the good guys, the sort of butyrate short-chain fatty acid producers, but you don't see a consistent enrichment in the bad guys. So there are qualitatively different types of dysbiosis across different diseases. So it's important to think about this. Diarrhea is an example where just everything changes, the whole system's turning over. 
Another component is uh, about half, so this is the fraction of those significant differences that are shared across multiple studies for a given study. So these are non-specific associations. So if you were to do a case control study of colorectal cancer, you get a bunch of hits, uh, but you don't know which of those hits are specific or diagnostic of CRC, or are they shared across many diseases. And so what we're showing here is about half of the hits are not specific to a given disease. And as far as diversity, species diversity in the gut microbiome, we only see one example where there's a consistent difference, and that is in uh, essentially enteric infections. So Clostridium difficile infections, for example, uh, people who have CDI have lower alpha diversity in their gut microbiomes. But for a lot of these other diseases, we don't see a consistent alpha diversity signal. And alpha diversity is interesting in, in C. difficile infection. So this is another study I worked on in my postdoc with Sepa de Pakpour, um, where we showed that you could predict recurrent C. diff uh, to some degree. It was a noisy signal and we didn't have a very, very large cohort. But essentially pre-treatment, you, you saw that patients that had lower alpha diversity tended to be those that recurred in their infection. So, uh, that, that's, that's where I'm going to take us today in, in the research that's, that's currently ongoing in my group is thinking about the ecological structure of the microbiome and how that relates to C. diff infection risk. So we know there are a lot of risk factors for C. diff and the strongest one is antibiotics. Age is another, but antibiotics overwhelmingly comes up again and again as the strongest uh, risk factor for, for C. diff. And, and antibiotics also are known to drastically deplete the diversity of our gut microbiomes. So it seems that there's some sort of niche saturation, some sort of uh, ecological barrier to the invasion of C. diff, uh, and there's a lot of mechanisms there that I won't go into uh, that prevent it from invading, but antibiotics can deplete the commensal diversity to the point where there's, there is niche space open for C. diff to invade. Normally we're walking around with a nice healthy ecosystem, but if you take antibiotics, it's like setting off a, a wildfire in your gut. You burn things down, and sometimes when you burn things down, the weeds, can invade the system. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have heard of, of fecal transplants, but uh, you know, essentially, Clostridium difficile recurrent C. diff infections, if you recur two or three times, it's very unlikely that vancomycin will resolve your disease going further. So antibiotics tend not to be effective in treating multiple recurrent C. diff infections. In the US, we had about 500,000 C. diff infections a year uh, and about 30,000 deaths from C. diff uh, each year. That was a stats from a few years ago. Um, so this was a, a serious problem and people were dying from these recurrent infections that, that were unresolvable by antibiotics. But we figured out that if you just take a little poop from a healthy person and you, and you squirt it up at the bum of a sick person, uh, they are cured overnight. It's actually remarkable how, how fast that is. In a matter of hours, they're having normal bowel movements and they, they, feel, they feel better. A bit of a miracle cure, and it's kind of the first example of how the microbiome has been, in ecological engineering, has been applied to, to clinical practice. So in the US, at least, the FDA is allowing for these procedures to, to go forward, um, given that someone has recurrent C. diff. Uh, the actual original clinical trial showing efficacy here, the phase three trial, they actually had to halt it early uh, because uh, in the antibiotic wing, only about 30% of the patients were, were resolving, and 95% of patients were resolving in the fecal transplant wing. So they thought it was unethical to continue giving people antibiotics, and they stopped it, and they gave everybody fecal transplants. So it's a great example of, of a big success in my field. So um, it'd be nice if you didn't have to go through this whole recurrent C. diff uh, process in the first place, right? What if you could diagnose those people a priori who are going to recur and use fecal transplants as a first-line treatment? I know that's, that's controversial from the perspective of regulators, but potentially uh, an interesting way to go uh, and reduce a lot of suffering and potentially death. So that brings us to, to the first project out of my group. This is the, actually the first paper that was published out of my group. Uh, and it's a collaboration with Lee Hood and Nathan Price and other a couple of faculty members at my institute. Uh, and two really talented postdocs, Tomasz Wil Wilmanski and Noah Rappaport, where we're trying to sort of see the imprint of the ecological structure of the microbiome in the host. Can we actually predict something about what's happening in your gut by looking in your bloodstream? And I won't bury the lead, uh, so this came out uh, a couple months ago. Uh, we are able to essentially predict, to some degree, the, the diversity of the gut microbiome from the blood metabolome. Um, so we, we fit a, a sparse linear regression model called a lasso model, um, 
I won't go into the, the details, but we can talk after if you're interested. Uh, and we can explain, explain about half of the variation in, in alpha diversity uh, in the gut from the blood metabolome. And if those of you who are used to working with omics data, it's, it's very noisy data to begin with. So anytime you see a correlation coefficient of 0.7, that's, that's about as good as you get, usually. Um, the, the model retained about 40 metabolites. Out of about 1,000 metabolites that were input, uh, we ended up having coefficients, non-zero coefficients for about 40 metabolites. Most of them were lipids, but you also had uh, xenobiotics, uh, uh, dipeptides and tripeptides, and a few other things. And if you look at the metabolites that were most consistently um, explanatory across the different uh, cross-validations and different uh, validation cohorts, we had an 11 metabolite model here that explained most of the variation. And uh, it was sort of a sanity, sanity check for us. So many of these make sense. The yellow ones are microbial host co-metabolites. They're metabolites that are in the bloodstream only because of the activity of our microbiome. So for example, hip, hip urate and cinnamoglycine, these are both derived from uh, polysaccharides in our diets, polyphenols. So hip urate is essentially a, a benzoate with a glycine added to it. And so we eat, say, polysaccharides from plants, our microbiome breaks that down into benzoate, we absorb that into our bloodstream, it travels to our liver, gets a glycine added and becomes hip urate. So we only see it because of our microbiome. And hip urate and cinnamoglycine are essentially um, markers of a healthy lifestyle. It means you're eating a lot of plant material if you have a lot of these in, circulating in the blood. P. crystal sulfate, on the other hand, um, it's also positively correlated with alpha diversity, but it is a protein fermentation byproduct and it's a known toxicant to the liver. So uh, also a warning to those who always associate high diversity with, with good health outcomes in the microbiome, I would push back on that a little bit and say it's a, it's a more nuanced story than that. Having more of this in circulation is probably not a good thing, but it's also positively correlated with diversity in certain cases. Uh, these two down here are secondary bile acids, uh, also produced by the microbiome, and the blacks are just host-derived uh, metabolites that are also associated with diversity. In particular, this one, 5-alpha androstan 3-beta 17-alpha, uh, it's a derivative of testosterone. And uh, it's, it's actually likely a yellow metabolite. We think that it's probably a testosterone derivative that's, you know, testosterone's chewed on by microbes and, and turned into this derivative. And it's positively correlated with diversity in both men and women, although it's higher in abundance in men than it is in women. So if, if we could have like a clinical test, a blood test, to assess someone's alpha diversity, could we potentially stratify patients? This is a, a question that we're, we're actively thinking about. Um, you know, you have niche saturation, which is sort of the niche space that's taken up by our commensals. As soon as that starts to drop off, you, you open a window up for invasive pathogens to get into the system, uh, and that's associated with alpha diversity. And so could we harness this model to try to do that? In a little bit of a proof of concept, we, we showed that you could actually predict the lower quartile of alpha diversity using this 11 metabolite model, uh, both across uh, test and validation cohorts. The AUC is around 0.88, not great, but not bad. Um, so th this is sort of our thinking of how to like in include the microbiome into sort of clinical diagnostics. And this is some cover art we made for the journal. I think it was a little too arty uh, for Nature Biotech. Um, but essentially, we have a great artist at our institute, Allison Kudla, and here we have you know, microbial uh, microbes in the sky, constellations in the shape of different metabolites, and the reflection in the you know, blood red ocean uh, of the metabolites below. Uh, yeah, I think it was too artful for, for the journal. So uh, that's, that, that's thinking about how do we see the microbiome etched in the, the state of the host, how much of the variation in the ecology is actually reflective of variation in host physiology or phenotype. Uh, and now I'm just gonna go off on a, on a little bit of a kind of silly but kind of fun project that my grad student's working on, looking at uh, demographic risk factors for C. diff infection that you may not have expected. So this is work by Alex Carr, a great grad student in my group, and an uh, undergraduate intern, Eric Tran, who, who works with, with Alex. And I'm a proud data parasite, so I'm using uh, some really large data sets here. Um, this is the American Gut data set from the Knight Lab, and then our institute has also created a very large data set that includes microbiome and host data uh, from, from this Aerial company. Uh, and I'm also gonna use some electronic health records from the Providence Healthcare System, which, which recently uh, partnered with our institute, and it's about five million patients on the west coast of the US. And we're gonna start with theoretical ecology. 
so I love whenever theoretical ecology is relevant for medicine. Island biogeography theory was, you know, came, come, was come up with by MacArthur and Wilson back in 1967. Um, and it's, it's a neutral model to explain sort of high level uh, statistics about, about species on archipelagos. So this is the Hawaiian archipelago, for example. So essentially, uh, species migrate from the mainland to, to islands over time. When they get there, they, they replicate. Occasionally, they speciate. Islands that are further away from the mainland, uh, it, it, it's di more difficult to disperse to those islands. Uh, and larger islands can support more individual organisms. And, and thus, uh, it also comes out of the theory that they can support more species. Bigger islands have more taxa. Even if you don't invoke any sort of mechanistic model, just by pure neutral process, this is true. Uh, and over the years, it's been a well-supported theory in ecology. It's one of the best supported theories in, in ecology. Even if you use different deterministic formulations versus stochastic formulations, they all sort of predict this. And when you go out and measure it, when you account for some of the confounders, you tend to almost always see this effect. So we, were think we thought, how, does this apply to commensal microbial communities? So first, to, to sort of solidify and formalize our thinking, we, we did a little bit of modeling. So you build a little model that sort of mimics what's happening in the gut, like a chemostat. So you can think of our gut as, a, as an anaerobic bioreactor. There's an input, there's an output, and there's a constant flux of material. So we have a flow in this model. Things are constantly flowing through. You have a, um, a resource input rate, immigration, emigration, uh, and, and we're looking at area instead of volume, just for simple, simple to simplify the model and, and speed up computation. Uh, but it, um, what we end up seeing is that indeed, in this neutral model, we get, an, we get an association, it's a weak association, but highly significant, that bigger areas harbor more species. And if you look over larger ranges of area, like log axes, you, this, this actually looks much stronger, the relationship, but we were interested in thinking about humans. Like if you think about human gut length, we don't vary over orders of magnitude in human gut length, maybe a factor of two at the most, right? Uh, four foot tall versus eight foot tall human, perhaps. Uh, so we, we kind of limited it by a three-ish fold range of area, but even in that range, you still get a significant association. If you collapse quantile bins and look at the mean trend, you know, the, the mean is nice and monotonically increasing. Larger, uh, larger models tend to have um, more species. Okay, so people have actually looked at this in vertebrates. Uh, so if you uh, look at animal size, uh, it's also, proportional to gut length. And if you look at, at diversity, you do indeed find a trend. So bigger animals have more diversity in their gut microbiomes. An elephant has a more diverse gut microbiome than a mouse. Um, and there are interesting deterministic things going on here too, where the green dots are herbivores. They tend to be a little more diverse than you'd expect from the scaling theory. Uh, the red carnivore and, and the brown insectivores are a bit below the line. So if you eat more plants, you have more diversity in the, and that's sort of generally known in the microbiome. But is this true in humans? So we, we wanted to look at, is, is human height associated with diversity in the gut microbiome? Oh, oh my gosh. So I, <laughs> it's not plotting all the, all the points, but, but uh, what you should be seeing is a, is a fairly noisy cloud of points here. Sorry about that. Um, and, and this is the trend line. And you know, the R squared is this. So if we control for things that are known to affect the diversity of the gut microbiome, like uh, sex, antibiotics, and age, um, we, we, we get a, a significant association. And the R squared is about 0.06, 6% of the variance explained, super low R squared. But if we go back to our model, doop, sorry about that, uh, we're only explaining 3% of the variation. So we expect it to be a noisy signal. <laughs> sorry. OK. And again, if you, if you collapse to, to mean quantiles, you get this sort of monotonic increase in, in diversity as you increase in height. Um, and interestingly, uh, sex is, is a sort of a associated with diversity as well. But if you build a model that includes height as a covariate, the, the sex effect goes away completely. So it seems like um, differences in diversity between men and women are driven largely by differences in average height between men and women. Okay, that's in the Arabel data set. So we wanted to replicate this and see if this was true in another data set. See if my point, oh, my points are also gone here. So, um, <laughs> sorry about that. But, but in, in the American gut data set, both for men and women, uh, you, you get this significant association with, with diversity and height. Uh, and here again are the kind of quantiles to, to see it. Super cool. 
Uh, <laughs> I think it's cool, I'm, I'm, I'm an ecologist, but is this really relevant for, for clinical medicine? So then the big question you might be asking, well, since diversity is sort of associated with recurrent C. diff infection, might it be the case that if uh, you have a C. diff infection, are you shorter than you'd expect by chance? So. Um, in terms of diversity, so we had C. diff data for this American gut cohort. So we had whether you were diagnosed by a doctor with C. diff. So uh, on Shannon diversity, indeed, there is a significant but you know fairly weak effect that um, people with lower diversity tend to be those that were diagnosed with C. diff. And if you look at height, you also see a significant effect. It's, it's again, very noisy, but you're a couple centimeters shorter on average if you had C. diff infection versus the general population. Okay, so there's a lot of issues and caveats with the American Gut data set. It's all self-reported data. So we wanted to sort of validate the height versus C. diff result in a, a more rigorous way. So we moved to electronic health records. Um, and this is work with my, uh, another colleague at the Institute, uh, Jen Hadlock. So she, she specializes in machine learning, natural language processing, and e EHR records. She's an MD. Um, and her, her and her, her research scientist, Jewel Lee, pulled down about two million EHR records from the Providence system. Uh, and this is probably too small for all of you to read. I don't expect you to see all the details. The reason I put up this slide is essentially to show that, you know, this is, this is sort of the age distribution of people in this cohort. And we tend to see that most of our data is coming from people between 50 and 90 years old. And we're actually underrepresented in people who are very young or people who are very old, like 90 to 100. So our power is limited in these older and younger groups, but we have pretty good statistical power for these groups here. Um, and here is just showing the actual numbers of C. diff versus non-C. diff across men and women. Generally, 0.333% of, of women are, were, were diagnosed with C. diff and 0.299 uh, percent of men. So there's a slight enrichment in women versus men, and you can see that here. Uh, and this kind of goes away again once you incorporate height as a factor into the model. So if you look across age, do we see that, uh, that height is associated with C. diff? Again, it's a weak effect, but generally, yes, it is the case that you're about two or three centimeters shorter, whether you're a man or a woman, if you had a C. diff infection. And actually, the biggest effect is gender, if you, if you, if you don't use covariates. Uh, but that's mostly explained by the fact that uh, the average height of a woman is about 15 centimeters shorter than the average height of a man. Um, so height seems to be associated here. Um, th these are our p-values, so that, say this is significance here. We only have significance for this middle cohort of, of kind of middle-aged and, and older people, but that's mostly just because of power. We have many, many more people in those bins than we do. So it seems to be a consistent effect, and as long as we have sufficient power, we can sort of see that effect. So kind of cool. So maybe maybe we could, so we're actually working now on trying to calculate you know, how much risk does it, do you increase for every centimeter of height that you lose, right? Um, and we want to get at mechanism as well. We don't want to just have this sort of statistical understanding of what's going on. So, so my postdoc, Christian Diener in the lab, uh, along with our collaborator, Osvaldo, in Mexico City, we're developing a metabolic model of the gut. So we pulled down 818 whole genome metabolic models from Agora, uh, and we're integrating those into a whole microbiome metabolic model or metagenome scale metabolic modeling, where we can, I can essentially sequence your gut microbiome, and I can initialize the model with the abundances of the species for, for your particular system. Uh, and we also input a diet. Uh, we have these PAT diets we can pull down from the virtual metabolic human, but you could also curate your own personalized dietary model if you knew the macromolecular uh, composition of the diet. You can run the model, calculate the fluxes, get the growth rates for all the different species. Um, and so this is sort of a tool we're using. We're, we're also validating this with, with experiments, but we're, we're using this as a tool to ask, you know, under what conditions does C. diff invade someone's gut microbiome? So you might imagine people, you have a population of people with really low microbiome diversity, but only a subset of them get invaded by C. diff or are susceptible to invasion. And that's likely because they're stochastically missing some of these important commensals that are actually prophylactic to C. diff invasion. That niche is not filled. So we can, we can so this, this is all data from a single metagenome, metagenome initialized metabolic model where we knock out individual species and look at interactions among species. So for example, if I knock out uh, bacteroides, where are you, bacteroides? Uh, there. If you knock out bacteroides, you see a lot of red things coming off of it. That's to say that if you pull bacteroides out of the model, 
the growth rates of a lot of other species increase. So bacteroides seems to be inhibiting the growth rate of a lot of other species in this particular model uh, initialization. And Acromancia, Mucinophila, if you knock it out, a lot of organisms, their growth rates decrease. So it seemed to have a lot of cooperative associations. And we can build these models and we can essentially try to knock in C. diff, because we have a model for, for Clostridioides difficile as well, uh, and ask, does it have a positive growth rate at the end of the model? And we can sort of petition these low diversity patients and see which ones are susceptible and which ones aren't to, to, to invasion. All right. So uh, the last point I'll, I'll end on here, is that this is all kind of preliminary. It's not a finished story. It's sort of a rough cut of, of what we're working on. Um, I also think because it's such a noisy signal, uh, it, this is very amenable to lifestyle correction. So a four foot tall vegan could very well have a much more diverse microbiome than an eight foot tall carnivore, right? It's, it's, a, it's a noisy signal, it's a, it's a solid signal, but you can modulate it with lifestyle. So, so potentially we could use this to inform um, medicine, epidemiology, and we could also potentially alleviate this problem through lifestyle intervention. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank all the, all the folks in my lab who did the work in bold here, Christian, Alex, and Eric. Collaborators, Tom, Noah, Nathan, and Osbaldo for, for most of the work and, and others, along with uh, Washington Research Foundation funds my startup package. Um, and uh, this is a great crowd to work with. Um, and thanks to all of you for listening.